Welcome to Spirit of Place. My name is Padraig Tuma, and I'm a poet and a theologian. Spirit of Place is a journey of poetry and dance and film and music and language and conversation between Ireland and Scotland, following along the old roots of Columba, also known as Cullum Killa, who 1500 years ago made his way from Derry across to Scotland. He was a saint and a political figure and a traveller, a restless man, I'd say, and a writer too of hymns and poetry. As we think about what it means to be in this continent of Europe, as well as in this westerly part of the continent of Europe, with questions about climate change in our ears, questions too about how to embody the spirit of hospitality that was so esteemed in those ancient poems and hymns and religious systems during a time now when borders seem to be getting more barbed rather than more hospitable. These are the questions we're going to hold together, speaking with artists together about how a spirit of place can be enlivened by old hymns, old prayers, old stories, old pilgrim routes that can be made refreshed and renewed. We're in conversations with poets and choreographers, filmmakers, people who work in multiple languages, people who translate. And we'll be asking questions about language, as well as the deep motivation behind art and the awareness about what it means to be an artist today on this planet facing this crisis. And thinking about how, given where we work and live, we are in a certain kind of long echo after St. Columba. To have an authentic cultural identity, I think you need to understand the mysticism of your culture. And by mysticism, I don't mean anything misty, even though it rhymes. I mean the absolutely concrete, the stories that people told in the place where you live, the way they understood the seen and the unseen universe, the language they used to speak about the dead and the living, and how people understood ritual, how people understood transition, how people understood community, bringing people in, farewelling people. All of these systems of understanding retain knowledge and retain powerful information for us as we seek to be wise in our human community as well as in our planet. Join us on this journey of Spirit of Place. Do that, 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 do that,
For over 30 years, Canadian filmmaker Marlene Meller has created dance films, documentaries and experimental media productions. In 2019, her expansive career was honoured at a retrospective solo exhibit at Threshold Art Space in Perth in Scotland, the process-driven continuum of the Migration Dance Film Project, including Navigation, directed by Miller and choreographed by Sandy Silva, has garnered over 40 awards and prizes internationally, including the 2021 Best Canadian Short Film at Festival International du Film sur l'Art. A prolific educator and mentor, Miller leads filmmaking workshops internationally from Burkina Faso to Nunavut. Kate Daly hails from Doolan in County Clare and is a singer of traditional folk songs and has classical vocal training. Kate now works with an environmental education and training company and enjoys bringing her creative facilitation from her academic studies to her passion for environmental and social sustainability. As she hopes to facilitate singing groups once again in her local community, namely with the Liz Moran singers post pandemic restrictions. Marlene, I'd really like to come to you first and to talk about this extraordinary percussive dance piece that you filmed, choreographed by Sandy Silva. You know, watching people in their anoraks and hats and small backpacks and the sound of skin on skin, as well as the voice and the rustle of their clothes. I thought of this piece of navigation like some kind of body poem, an entire all-body experience to hear it. I kept on crying every time I watched it. Could you tell us a little bit about what it was that you were intuiting as you were seeking to film it in such a particular way? Challenges and, and one of the really special things about working with uh, Sandy Sylvan and the group of dancers that make up the Migration uh, Dance Project um, is the fact that they, they create their own music, you know, it comes out of their body. And I, I just, it's uh, going on seven years that we've been working together now. Um, but every project just intrigues me more, you know, with their potential for being able to express themselves, not just through movement, but through sound. And um, I've always really been drawn to connecting not just like mind and, and body in the work, but mind, body, and the land and, and the landscape and the environment. So um, having the opportunity to, to work on this project in, in the burn was exceptional, it was really like a, a high point in everything that I have done to date. Um, just, just those connections like that you pointed out, you know, uh, amongst themselves uh, with the individual, but then just like the sound and the contact against the limestone and, and then maneuvering through the, the choir that are just seemingly anchored there um, in the land was, was a fantastic challenge. You know, the bit that moved me enormously, the, 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 the singing, the percussion, the body work, and then scattered throughout the whole piece, which people can watch fully online, scattered throughout the whole piece, there's, there's moments of people running. And of course, running can be sometimes for uh, play, but running can also be for safety. And it was that that struck me to think about the echoes of feet running in the midst of a piece of dance was so powerful and resonance of resonant of threat as well as resonant of the body's capacity. Uh, that's amazing. It's amazing that you you were drawn to that. It was um, the first image and the first sound that I had for the film, even before we created the choreography. It was just I had this sort of image burnt in my mind of feet running, you know, not necessarily connected to a particular person, but just that image and, you know, are you fleeing or are you running towards something, um, you know, sort of abstracted from place and, and person, uh, just, just that energy and that constant movement and the rhythm of it to, to bring the rhythm of the feet pounding against the, the pavement 
almost like a heartbeat as well. So I felt well, it was like very connected to the per- percussive dance we were moving into. Kate, you're from Doolan at the foot of the burn, the limestone hills of Clare. Kate, I'm going to ask you an utterly impossible question to answer. But the, here's the question. What does the burn mean to you? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> sorry, not, not sorry. <laughs> Um, I suppose, funnily enough, leading up to this, I was thinking, you know, that spirit of place. And when I think of the burn, Doolan, it's home. And I suppose we all have home with our families and different ideas of home. But for me, that kind of Doolan and the actual, the rock uh, where we're placed, that space will be home, whether I'm in a different continent or not and representatives of that are witnesses like the land is witness to all these people uh, moving through it and we we never own it you know we're caretakers of it and yeah I suppose it's it's that that privilege as well to be to call it home. Oh sorry would you mind I just just when Kate was uh, so wonderful when you were talking about uh, the burn representing home for you and that it's it's not just the landscape but it's the community and I would just like to add like we were introduced to the burn through a member of the choir <laughs> and and through hearing a limestone archie the song that they're singing at the beginning um, and and we were so drawn in to the to the to everything that that landscape represents but we we wouldn't have even ventured to do a project there if we hadn't had the the welcome of the community and the community choir that, you know, embraced the project with us and um, really invited us in. And you were all there every step of the way, like sharing places and locations and songs with us. So it was such a beautiful collaborative and, and very inviting project. Marlene, I was struck by the filming of the piece in black and white, which showed then the dancers in the same hues as the landscape. And it seemed like nature was all of one piece, you know, the nature of limestone and the nature of limbs. I was curious about the choice in um, choosing black and white. Yes, it was a decision. um, Both Sandy and I were very involved in the creation of the piece. And it was something that we discussed because, you know, over the year and a half that we were researching and developing the project, we had made two trips to um, the burn before filming you know so we did a lot of exploratory work uh, both you know deciding on where to film what type of movement to be working with uh, what vocal compositions we might incorporate but it was the look and so we were going between color black and white color black and white but uh, as, as you just mentioned it's the, the limestone is so prominent and that is really what we were drawn to and and the shapes etched in it you know, um, and especially seen from above, it just looks oh. like this incredible map. And then to to have all of the performers and the singers almost as like specks on this ginormous map. And yeah, so to, to render it all in the tones of the the ground that, that we were connected to, um, we felt was the way to go. Afric Makaya is the Irish language poetry editor of Poetry Ireland Review, Gorse and the Stinging Fly. Her first poetry collection, Gaval Syrinx, The Taking of the Syrinx, was published by Anne Sagart in 2010. And her work has been translated into many languages, including French and German, Italian, Spanish and Czech. She's been awarded several bursaries by the Arts Council. And in recent years, she's read at numerous festivals in Europe, America, Canada and India. And her latest collection, Foreign News, with translations by David Wheatley, was published by the Gallery Press in 2017. And she lives in Dublin, where she now works for the Irish language publisher, Angoom. And thank you to the spirit of the place for this invitation. I'm going to read a poem in Irish and English, a section of a longer poem about the expression, an expression in the Irish language. Colleen Bregoch, the the brother's lying maid. The story goes that the brothers had a maid and she was very lazy and she would always put everything on the long finger. And whatever job she was asked to do, she would always say, I was just about to do it. And one of the brothers caught her out anyway one day and he said to her, have you washed those books yet? 
And straight away, she gave her old excuse, of course, I, I was just about to do it. And when I heard the expression, I was working for the English Irish Dictionary. And one of my colleagues asked me, had I done a piece of work? And I said, no, nope, I was just about to do it. And he said, oh, Colleen Brake of Namotra. And I, of course, asked him to explain it. And he explained it. And I knew straight away that I would have to write about it because I felt that it worked, number one, for writer's block, but also for, for the world's troubles and for, for the way the world is unraveling a bit in real time. And we all have this sense that we need to do something. So I read a little section from it now in Irish with translations by the Irish poet David Wheatley. Colleen Bregoch Nam Rosha Blues Einin Mal Trilach and Dorachel Nadov Snanopi Kul Anna Anod Nalar Nature Hur A Hulsa A Foshna Fallen Ivan Bro No Gedictor Snagnova Gwil and Sail Loiva Kur O Athen Ni Fear on Hain and Tulk the brother's little white light girl. Glossary. A dull slow fuse in the black dark, in the end notes, a nod and a wink. The books washed as you predicted, but the knowledge in your blood is less than you think until you get it deep in your bones that you can dismiss the world of the here and now, face harm down with a no. Roma simi yag if we know again a spawn, conin cos or hoslum, calling break of the mrosha. Neon lower and toys a rocker he the hayfuck, Gershkirwe he comes mean of ungna, firth and shan a hoch, be she, the rich she, or she and bark a yano. Before and behind me in the windows lining the street, the brother's little white light girl is tripping over my feet. Wash the book. So swayed was she by the command that the old refrain, old lie, slipped out without a second thought. She was, she said, just off to do it. Tosach an hra lawr ni spoike, chan chofir le karp nia vilchu. Anatza an il a vwinch as tloch, anatza ne chinche avu fin loch. Love's first flush, honeycomb words, the honest speech of unschooled limbs. Yours is the power to draw blood from a stone, the power to draw sparks from a lake. Um, you, in the first section of that poem that you read, you use my favorite word, Oskoelga, knava. Um, I don't know why I've always loved that <laughs> word. Partly it's just saying it, it's just such a, an enjoyable thing to say. Uh, but nu gudigtur sum knava, until you perceive or understand in your bones, there's something about the ways within which um, bone deep knowledge is powerful for you when it comes to Irish language. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about your relationship with Irish language more broadly than just your poetry, but just in general. Um, yeah, it, it's, it is. I mean, I, I would always, you always inevitably get asked why you write in Irish and the answer I always give and it's a glib one is it's part of, it's part of my bones <laughs> it's part of my blood and bones I my father was professor of geography but he he believed very strongly and he wasn't alone that the only way to save a language was to to educate people in every subject so he would provide all of his lecture courses in Irish so that there would be a geographer with Irish and um, that's so interesting about your father being professor of geography and that language and landscape are intertwined. And of course, we know there globally, there's this link between endangered, there, globally, there's this link between endangered places ecologically, as well as endangered languages in those places. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your curiosity and interest and awareness in those and that precarious tying of language and landscape. It's the coastal areas, it's the small islands, it's the places that are vulnerable, most vulnerable to climate change. 
that's where the languages and the linguistic communities are in are in danger. Um, and as as people move and as people get swallowed up, languages will be will be lost. We we know it. Um, I I suppose it's hard to be. It's easy to think in abstracts, isn't it? And it's very hard to think of of what that means, what that will mean, like as as fishing, traditional fishing and farming methods disappear, what disappears with them. And I don't know. I don't know. Sorry, that sounds awfully waffly, doesn't it? Well, it's great. I mean, I think what you're highlighting is the the knife edge on which these experiences and landscapes coexist, languages and landscapes, really. Yeah. And now it's a great joy to speak with Owen Stewart. Owen Stewart is a Gaelic speaker, Indigenous Highlander, a lover of Irish and a learner of Norwegian who plays shinty and likes going walking and running, working in education and dabbling also in writing and broadcasting. For many years, he has been involved with the Columkill Initiative, running Iman Columkilla, which links the Gaeltachts of Ireland and Scotland through both the sister sports of shinty and hurling and through the medium of Irish and Scottish Gaelic. He won the Gaelic Prize at Wigtown in 2021, as well as being shortlisted for the main prize. And his first collection, Bemskea, will be released by Acker in the winter of 2021. Nave Columkilla has meant a great deal to him his whole life, growing up in a Christian household. His parents talked about Columba a lot, and his house in Inverness is only a few hundred yards from many places that are intrinsically linked with Columkill's mission to the Picts. And so, Owen, lead us away with a poem, and then we'll have a bit of a chat about a few of your poems. Gormagat, it's top life. Owens, I call you I. Yich mi smear in abich suver, on an solace fesker daver. Peter earned the hook me megwish, cuse och uanye craig fadrig. A craig eachert for hot the chew, jehonich is jehonisk. Cruas ich me a shown den vrigi, ax ne toti can gonich je, iguaroch oozed and taivod, as cassin cahat in uvere. Marach og a mesk a usich, agus maskig vo gach uavish. Sperla, I ate the ripe, juicy brambles in the light of an October evening, this peter on which I built my church, the green pine forest of Craig Fadrig, the lower rock under a thick coat of gorse and moss. I considered Brood's old fort and the vitrified ruins of the big house and the legs of the giant's chair, my young fostering amongst these pines and my shelter from all terror. I love all your poems, Owen. I just find myself so transfixed by the way that you link things like those juicy brambles, smur and abaki sugmort, and then the old fort as well. You've got an extraordinary link between the extant and the fresh and the ancient, the self-renewing as well as the relic. It's an, a really interesting way within which you play in time, uh, using nature as well as ruins in your poems. Um, sorry to break the fourth wall, folks, but um, up there talking about walls uh, behind my house here is Craig Fadrig, um, which is Peter's Rock. And I like to play with the idea of, you know, Peter being the rock, Petra. Um, and the word Craig as well, of course, meaning a rock as well. Um, and at the top of the, the fort here is, is King Brood's fort. Um, supposedly he may have met Colm Kilia in the centre of town where the old high church is, but there's also... I believed that he would have had a fort at the top of Craig Fadrig and the ruins are still there. Uh, the vitrified, um, for those who don't know, that vitrified means that the, the walls are heaped up of rocks and then set alight to fuse them together so they become like glass. Yeah, a shulch in the grainye. A shulch in the grainye, un esker sound of fuer, a jirig soos ne peinye, er tor and tolus vuein, a tolus jain and gahan, a haas tron a geikif, so ur and tus a gauri, a fosco game of yellow. A shul hun the greenye, for skull and gurrame cruvach, nyef with that a gurrman, kinnich and gach to yum. Rohegilia hergashin is in bala creek miloir, and tau we cruis in diamond. The lawn we fall some wan. Walking to the sun one cold November evening, ascending the mountain in pursuit of the everlasting light, chasing the rays that stab through the branches a new world in the mouth of winter opening before me. Walking to the sun under blue tree shadows, heaven with the shade of indigo and memories either side of me, frost whitening the wind, 
and the fallen boundary wall, the earth is hard as diamond and the puddles full of reflections. Real and Tauri. Gav me coerced it eiche, le inge jig yallich, and a satchel a gooset, good oil trantur lea, as kuen virin dua in the kalye, for no real, for lay a taich, my choravan, reg eg a barstje, as va a vruach wan, je churoch, chrocht och nan kruv, as gallic glan and tauri. I walked out one night with a fingernail moon and a satellite moving carefree through the light blue dark above the black needles of the forest where one star was hanging about like a heron on the top branch, and the whole hillside was filled with the lichened perfume of the trees and the pure promise of summer. Yeah, uh, and again, I think um, it's quite obvious that Anza um, Khadiyai uh, is, a, is, a, is an autumn poem. Uh, Shul Nakin the Grainy is a winter poem, and Real and Tauri is a, obviously a summer poem. And Kru Arachig is really um, kind of an equinoxal Easter spring poem. Uh, and I'll read the English first and then come back to the Gaelic, if that's okay. okay. Uh, the Transfiguration. I returned last night to the very same place. There was no sign of cloud or shadow in the dusk on the high mountain, or the transfiguration that came that day in the forest, when the one wind poured in transfiguring it, dressing it in the clothes of the ocean. The branches blew like swells, every limb back, a wave crest crashing, the psalm of the seas from the green surge sharp and sweet and lasting in my ears and I walked the narrow way through a pine forest filled with the dance of life. But tonight on the holy mountain, its countenance was different. The forest was again just that, a forest, the calm birches radiating white, and I took pleasure in the evening tranquility, before I arose unafraid like Peter, setting the sea to one side, because I had seen the other world secured as it always will be, by the red living mouth of the tree. In Cru Aharachug, Heal me a roid gan jarabach, Haruskiel, Irsko, no skal, Sahir, Giravain Arst, Nun cru arha gahanig and lashin, Sahali Hruvig, Nirvan Unagu, a tumig, a torst orra, and jal hurkli, as ye hur huin unpe mar udoch, Hage nikig and nansulian, Gachmir, Marvar haun, a bullig, Salam the mara on after a huanye, Bedoch bin buin namahuasen, as me a shul, shli huin hul, throw you so huan dance and hurl. A chariot in a vain nerve, a crew ill at Clara Hooten, a chalia irish, a chalia cast, a bain cune, a jowl, a grow yow. Was me a gal tlach, come fey and esker. Was to yearig me my fetter can yickle, a vurg a curk and dare two, where scars can fark to me and soul ill, jarrif the maravigay hoy, the grap, your jerrick, the cruver. Last question from me. I'm I'm curious about the ways within which Colum Kilia has been a story in your family. It was always just very weird about Columba. Like I say, growing up in Inverness, him coming to visit the Picts, um, the idea that he may have been, you know, walking around these places. That was something we were always very aware of. In fact, my father was inducted um, in St Columba's Church, uh, St Columba High in Inverness, which is now uh, moved. Um, but you know, there's uh, he's in inesca- inescapable really. Uh, but then my links with um, Ireland through Gaelica and through Kamanacht Imain Shinti um, also made a big, big uh, difference. Um, and that that linkage of, of that thing again, whether it's on a religious basis or on a secular basis, the importance of those links and the the the, the tragedy of the of the division that there has been between. Um, our people, but between our, within our people, uh, not peoples, but within our people, it has been one of the the great tragedies of the last four hundred, five hundred years. And to, so, so that idea of this this person connecting those things and and doing it in a way that brings people together, and is still inspiring people, you know, mm. you know hundreds of years later. Um, I think is something really quite um, profound. We are thrilled to introduce now a spectacular piece of art commissioned specially for the Spirit of Place project to mark Column Killa 1500. This piece of art is a collaboration between the poet Nilo Gallagher and filmmaker Vary Killen, and it's a response to Columba's epic 23 verse poem. This piece, Calling Time, on Vale Column Killa, brings us into the imagination of the privacy of the man known for his public, political and religious and cultural commentary. And in this collaboration between these two artists, we're brought to a cave on Iona, into the mind and sight and words of Columba. (laughs) 
Kanair is Jach, Donuai, the Karsh de Huang, Achivan, the Haring is some muth and Dushkemach, who shall lie. Gav me inche, Kassen Rusch, Gach Klach Glan is Ur from Hosh, can glain in your glorn and Hluish and Uignis and Huavisho. Rain ye gach clach, wish a live, a hood na arch ye gach rail, the sea it who cometh na hu, wish a yally hood, suspeed. Hood a balachin na huive, mungur shjodam, the sea it did fast, marvel heel, crekoch nan cruv, tov the tov with ood na trad. Slack a lava hack and heen, you lot a keel, a mask and glach, a cur car gave them of yod, my fatchet, the hill and glach. Lavet me and breer and cloich, mollig and chill at her arsed, a shem a grog as a new wife, Gertrug aim, fackland and barsed. Ida choich sho a savuth, ha mach gan dunya cho bik, arlam di shivyarn an vrij, a kinyuk vo skolt sa krik. A nai shijik na gai, a nai tumig an tal, bool ag taun yid el an i, gud an yon an jil a vaj. Sechilia Hanaimi Fosh, Gush me moch for Ashton Kuai, Lay and Lure even try, Ganyak van the Manach Truach. Honik me Tober Gun Ushk, Honik me a Murth Gun Yeshk, Talu Gun Shellan Gun Deal, Chief Gun Yerem in Tren de Tren. Gafasa gach ula shiel chuth an shielater fo vla, gafasa gil fo gach ni fo gach shiela jimagan. A chilig an ushke gerim jereg munya as an loif, shinya mi malav dan leis gan dal mus eri kan koan. Nilo Gallagher is the author of three collections of Gaelic poetry published by Clare, Baha Or from 2013, Shun on Trilaha from 2016 and Fovla from 2021. And he has been shortlisted and been the winner of multiple awards. And in 2019, he was appointed as the Bard Balia Glasgow, the Gaelic Poet Laureate for Glasgow, the first of that title. So, Niall, I'm delighted to talk to you. And what an extraordinary piece that you have written in response to that epic poem from Colm Kilia. Could you tell us a little bit about working with a 1500 year old poem and then trying to write something in response to that? I mean, it's such a, a big poem. It's such a fortissimo poem. Mm. It's such a, a public poem, the Altus Prosato. I mean, I think that part of the situation that I imagine for my own poem is that this is after the Altus Prosato. I imagine Colm Kilia having performed or declaimed this yeah. poem, perhaps yeah. chanted or sung this poem. I mean, it has these 
wonderful rhymes in Latin, doesn't it? These big chiming um, rhymes. And I imagine what happens then. And what I'm interested in, um, I mean, the palette is different. The size of the canvas is different. This is a sh relatively short piece, yeah. I think a four minute piece um, after this enormous poem where there's a stanza for every letter of the alphabet, which takes in all of God's creation. So what I imagine is that having done this, Colin Kilyer retreats and he leaves the Abbey and he retreats to this place, um, the cave, where we get to hear his private voice, his contemplative voice. And it's different from the voice of the Altus Prasatir in many, many ways. It's different because it's shorter, but it's also in terms of dynamic, more mezzo piano is quieter. Yeah. Um, it's different because it's in Gaelic. And one of the first things I had to ask myself is, if we accept the attribution of the Artus Prosatir to Colm Kilye, why then is this superlative medieval Latin poet speaking to us in Gaelic verse? Why is he doing that? Mm -hmm. And I imagine that that might be the language of his private voice, the language of his personal, personal contemplative voice. One of the things that the Altus Prasatir describes is, I think, the, the perfection of God's creation. And it does this in a very celestial way. Yeah. The, 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 the poem ranges through, through the cosmos and imagines everything within that cosmos having its place um, and, and being this, this great, the work of art of, of, of God as a creator. Um, and I thought that if we're going to try and imagine what Colin Killy would say in his private moment of contemplation, then we introduce an element which I don't think is there in the fortissimo public Latin poem, and that's the humanizing element of doubt. Yeah. We don't know Colin Killy the man. We know Colin Killy the saint. We know him as a poet. We know him as a, a man with a big political influence on the time in which he lived. We don't know him as a man, as a private man. Mm. Um, and so the gaps in what we know are where there's an opportunity for people working in the arts to come in and make things up, to imagine, yeah. to try and construct an image of what this person who is not available to us no. through the evidence might be like. Yeah. I was so struck by two particular parts of this poem, which I think really link into this toward the start of it. You know, that line about bare feet treading over pebbles. So this idea of, of not having um, about not having shoes on, there was a vulnerability to that somehow, maybe about holy ground, but also maybe about domesticity. And then this disturbing dream. So we're with him in his removing of his shoes, as well as then being with him in this dream where he's worrying about, you know, disorder and decay and sea without fish and land with no bees. There's something so interesting there in terms of the vulnerability of this character that you're imagining. But you're also speaking, I think, to contemporary issues, especially through this this nightmare that he has. I wonder if you could speak about both of those, the bare feet at the start and then the, the dream at the end. Well, it began with a conversation that Vary and I had in which I relied very much on her experience of this location, somewhere which, because of the pandemic, I wasn't able to visit. And so I relied on Vary's very detailed physical descriptions of this environment so that I could have some material that wasn't just the text of the Latin poem, but some other material um, to draw upon. And there were two very immediately important things that I learned from Vary. One was that it was a pebble surface underfoot. And the other was that it was only accessible at a certain point in the cycle of the tides. Um, the, the, pebble, the pebble surface underfoot is very important to me because I imagine that if we have had, one of the things we do is we, we, we collapse the lens so the lens of the Altus Prasatir is wide and it's taking in all of creation and it's taking in the stars. And, but what happens when we go into the cave and we imagine the same intelligence contemplating this much narrower environment, but one which in his philosophical position, in his faith, 
I imagine he would have considered as being just as demonstrative of God's creation as the bigger palette of the stars. And so in that dark environment, then what can he contemplate other than the pebble under his foot, which immediately becomes through a very fertile image, it immediately becomes the star. What does it mean that the same hand, and I'm imagining what Colin Killian's perspective may have been upon create the created world. What does it mean that the same hand created the star as created the pebble? Mm. What does that mean? And what does it mean to imagine, again, if we can personalize God, just as we would personalize this, this historical saint, why would one do that? Why would an artist who, who created the stars also create pebbles? So it, it's just, in a way, what's happening to my mind is that Colm Killier is replicating what he does in the Altus Prosator in terms of the contemplative um, content of that poem. But he's doing it within a much more, a much more enclosed space. That he can see fewer things. The other thing he can see, though, is, is this the vision. Yeah. The vision is important because the vision allows me to address something which was part of the conversation at the beginning of this project, which was about um, the contemporary anxiety over climate change, um, which I imagine if someone like Colin Killier could have witnessed, he would certainly have regarded as a, as a crime of, as a crime of blasphemy, as a crime of a crime against divine creation. Um, but in order to talk about that, what we're really talking about is the, the perfect creation envisaging the Altus Prosator falling apart or appearing to fall apart, appearing to lose its equilibrium. Larry, I'd love to bring you in to talk a little bit about the choice of specific location, not only Iona, but at the mouth of a cave in Iona and then looking out with that particular lens. It's quite extraordinary as the poem and the film as its accompaniment. Um, well, really, they're in conversation with each other as it goes through. I just find my eye drawn over and over again to the way within which we're looking at the same thing that's ever changing. Could you talk a little bit about place in your work as well as Iona and your choice of this place for the particularity of the film? Of course. Um I own as my home, obviously, and it's it's been home to many many generations of my of my family, Patrick. And um, the caves the caves on that part of the island are not easily accessible, so you can't even get to them. You can't even get to them by walking along the shoreline. The only way to get to them is either by boat or over the headland. And, and climbing down onto the shore. So they're they're really hidden. I mean, I don't know whether you know Iona at all, but they're they're very discreet, they're very hidden. They're exactly where I would imagine someone who needed contemplation and um, connection to place would go to this particular place, to the place of Iona. But away from the busy monastic life, away from the contemporary um, life of, of the island, of tourism and the ferry coming and going and, and, and all these busy layers of time, of contemporary time that, that, that fly around and keep us distracted and preoccupied. So the caves are somewhere actually, and it's a series of caves, but the cave that I filmed in is the main cave. Um, and mm. it's known as St. Martin's Cave. And so immediately you have you have that beautiful connection to St. Martin of Tours, to the Hermetic and the that tradition of the the um the ocean hermitage, the beautiful ocean her the hermitage and the challenging ocean hermitage. Um, so when, when I was invited to consider this project and this um, collaboration with, with Niall and with uh, Michael Begg, the composer, 
it was obvious to me it was a collaboration with Iona as well and with Place and hmm. with the legacy of Columba. I knew that I wanted the cave to be part of it. But to begin with, I thought I was going to have a series of images from around the island. And to begin with, I thought I would have a human form in the piece. But when I went to do the cave sequence and when I when I when I, over several, several days and several different stages of the tide and several different weather conditions, it just became so clear to me that it didn't need to be any more complex than sitting inside the cave and watching the tide come in, because that in itself revealed so much complexity and so much of the, the, the density of time on Iona but also the, 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 the lightness of time, the illumination of time on the island. Like Colm Kill, I'm an, an exile. Well, I don't live in my native country. And I've lived in a lot of different countries um, all around the world. So um, when I consider the theme of spirit of place, um, for me, it's not so much place as an absence of place because in my mind, I'm always trying to reconstruct and reimagine um, all of the places that I've been. And um, it's sort of like this memory just suspended in time more than an actual place that I'm, whenever I'm thinking of a place, it's, it doesn't really exist. Um, anyway, the the poem that I'm going to read now is called Ansenjelach, which means imparting, and it's it's a was written to as a the end of my latest book, which is called um, Dainadu, and it's about leaving Ireland, but it's also about leaving uh, the poems in my book and moving on to 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 other poems. Um, the translation uh, is in parting. It is not that the world has come to an end. The sun will rise tomorrow as usual. The blackbird will sing above the loch and a bell will ring in every town. The blue eye of the poet will look back at this troubling domain with fondness, with esteem. But there's a blank page before the poet's eye and it's hard to go against destiny. Uh, and just one last comment. The word for destiny is dain and dainakit, um, but that also means um, poem. So it's hard to go against the lure of the poem as kind of the double meaning of the last line. Anson Jelachag, Hanegun Tani Kriya Kerantu, Eriga Grian Amarak Marsavest, Shiny and Londu, Oskion and Locha, Agaspule Klaken and Skakbal. Shale su glass of art as a jay, er an arm jack her show, the mayor slimorn, a hadulia gvan for hula ward, a gasistulic curan agai and die. Gaelic psalm singing has been part of Callum Martin's life for as long as he can remember. I was always hoping to meet a composer who I could collaborate with to bring the musical ideas I had fermenting in my brain to fruition in one form or another, he said rather seeking a legitimate and unique art form which retains its authenticity and at the same time explores the amazing Shan Nose vocal style possibilities within an orchestral setting. And so he was fortunate to find in Craig Armstrong exactly that composer and their Edge of the Sea album is a result of this unique and extraordinary collaboration. Callum, I'm thrilled to be in conversation with you. I wonder yeah. if you could tell us a little bit about where you are Okay then. Well, it's it's a real pleasure to be with you, and uh, I'm always passionate and happy to talk about Gaelic psalm singing. Um, I'm living on the Isle of Lewis uh, near uh, the town of Stornoway, which is uh, the capital of of the island. Um, it's an island that uh, I grew up in, although I was away for a number of years, surrounded by the sea, and the whole Gaelic psalm thing. Uh, it's affected, I think, by the sea as well. So it's something that's been with me pretty much all my life since 
my grandfather took me to church when I was four years of age, uh, where Gaelic psalm singing was very much part of our service. Uh, it's very much a communal setting, very simple in its setting, no musical accompaniment. It's purely and simply the voices. And what I think makes Gaelic psalm singing special, it's this mix of voices. I say there are two things happening in Gaelic psalm singing. There's a vertical and there's a horizontal. The vertical is your connection with God vertically, where you're sitting in the church and you know the tune and the words and you have this sort of connection on an individual basis with him. But you've got a horizontal communal thing going on where you're also aware of what's going on round about you. And I think that's the two things that make it quite special. Could you tell us about the collaboration with Craig? I'm so interested to hear how that came about and what your contribution to it was and what you discovered as part of it. Yeah, well, like I said, and you mentioned, it's always been in my mind to see what we could do with Gaelic Sam singing without it becoming a gimmick or being taken out of, because essentially it is, uh, in its purest form, um, an accompanied vocal tradition. That really in its in its natural setting is within the walls of the church. I mean, in my youth, you would never have this being performed, you know, on a stage or on a setting. So a number of years ago, we were doing a, a we were invited to do, go to Celtic Connections with my Gaelic Sam group to put on a, a concert. And we did a, a collaboration with a group of singers from India, uh, where they came and did their Indian music and Across the internet, I collaborated with them and we did a Gaelic psalm together. It's really interesting because one of the things that fascinates me is the way that people sing the grace notes varies from country to country. So I've always been on the lookout to try and encourage uh, anything that would make people show an interest in it. And the collaboration with Craig was, Donald Shaw, uh, the artistic director, said to me, you know, if someone wants to meet you afterwards. And, you know, by that time I had, had loads of people getting in touch with me from hip hop artists in New York wanting to just take samples of it. And I wasn't interested in that. You know, it's not an add on gimmick. It has to be serious. And those were my first words to Craig Armstrong when I met him was, if you're really wanting me to do this, I'm not interested. But Craig showed how serious he was by wanting to come up and his 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 family on his father's side were presenters. So he came up and he came to a prayer meeting and he learned, you know, he, he absorbed himself in it. So I knew that this was a someone who really uh, I could work with. And uh, he also brought that expertise of taking the classical musical form uh, in to the mix along with it, with the thing. And I think what we what we were able to to create, I think, it's very respectful of both traditions, but yet, you know, uh, it introduces, hopefully, to the world uh, something that's very unique. Could you give us, Callum, a bit of an example of maybe uh, a, a phrase that would be sung in the style of a presenter and then perhaps something that would respond to that that might have a few grace notes in it? If, for example... Um, we took a tune like uh, Evan, okay, and the first four notes in Evan would be da, 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 okay, da, 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 is a geophane, that's the Gaelic for the Lord's my shepherd, da, 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 every time I go on my finger like that, that's your signpost note, that's your da, 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 so this is it. That's just the four notes. So then you take that out over the whole thing and you have every other person doing it with their own thing. That's Gaelic Sam singing. You know, as we look in the Spirit of Place project, we are so aware that 
you know, the islands between Ireland and Scotland are where Columbus sailed. Yeah. And also there has been such a sense of displacement across these islands and such a sense, too, that people for many generations had to leave their homelands and their languages yeah. in order to seek jobs in English speaking yeah. areas. But these days, of course, Ireland and Scotland are places to which people come. Yeah. And there's something so powerful in a tradition of musicality, like you're speaking about here, Callum, that is so much about the communal experience. And that is not just for the purposes of music, but it's also for the purposes of creating community. Fifteen hundred years ago, Columba made a journey from Derry across to Scotland. He was a prominent and a powerful figure with interests in religion and politics. And within the context of that, he wrote poetry that looked at the world, that looked at waves and birds and skies and clouds and cliffs and sea creatures and the land and the night and the morning. What he saw was brought into his understanding about what it meant to be alive. This project, 1500 years after Columba, has been a certain kind of echo of him, walking along with poets and filmmakers and singers and dancers, writers, choreographers, to consider what it is that they see and what it is that they see underneath their seeing. The crises we're facing, the opportunities we're facing. Just as Columba looked out and wrote the world as he saw it 1500 years ago, we too, as artists from across these islands, working across language, across borders, across imaginations, collaborate together to open up this reflection on spirit of place. We are delighted to have been with you on this journey and thank you very much for coming along with us.